In the fifth session of CAS, we're going to take a look at operating systems and more specifically, the support a CPU can give or provide to operating systems in order to implement certain functionalities. So let's first take a step back. Um, assume you have a simple RISC-V CPU. You have the CPU, you have some memory and think um, you have some machine, maybe a laptop on which you can compile RISC-V assembly to bytecode. And you also, I give you a device which you can use to load, to move that bytecode from your laptop to the actual memory of the RISC-V CPU. The device can initialize the registers in a state you want, and then it can, of course, um, read values from memories afterwards. So now with this mental image, my question would be, can you write useful programs with this? So maybe think about that for a second, pause the video. Can you write useful stuff with simply the things I've provided here? And well, the answer is of course, yes. Everything we've written up until now, um, all of the programs from the previous sessions could all be programmed in this fashion. Um, we are executing computations, um, but we are very limited. So we are lacking support, for example, for using a hard drive. We are lacking support for IO devices. Our CPU and memory it doesn't have a screen attached to it. There is no mouse, there is no keyboard. Um, and also we need a separate laptop on which we write the code that we want to run on the RISC-V processor. So yes, this is called, maybe you could call this programming bare metal. Um, programming directly on top of the CPU is possible, but it's not very useful. In reality, we use operating systems in order to make this easier. So an operating system, you can imagine having your CPU, your memory, your devices, um, and on top of that, on top of those devices, you have a big piece of software which handles everything for a user program. So let's say we're going to write a user application. The application can simply request the kernel, for example, to look at a certain location in memory, request the kernel to, um, well, the CPU is going to look in the memory, but request the kernel to, for example, um, to, to get input from a keyboard or, or input from a mouse or write to a hard drive. So we have this big piece of software that arranges everything for us. Um, so that the only thing we need to, we, the only thing we need to worry about is to actually write our code for our program. We can easily using the interface with the operating system. We can then use all of the services the operating system provides. Now this operating system also offers you a form of security. Whenever you write a program and someone else also writes a program and they're executing on the same computer, these programs, these processes are isolated from each other. Also your user program can not simply overwrite the code of the operating system. So there's a form of security here and you might then wonder how is this implemented? This is done using different privilege rings, typically in processors. There was other ways to do this. This is the most typical way. How does this work? You have, for example, a kernel running in ring zero. This is your operating system. This is the critical code. And this code runs with all of the privileges um, you can have, imagine. Um, what does it mean? It can execute any instruction. It has access. If this is ring zero and this is your most privileged level, it can do anything your processor can do. And then you add different rings, depending on what CPU, what architecture, you add different rings here that have different levels of privilege. Every level is allowed to do a little less than the previous level. On the outer ring, you could say you have user mode programs, for example, which might not be able to execute every single instruction in the instruction set. Um, they might be limited in what they are allowed to do. So this is a form of access control. Um, and this is heavily used inside of um, architectures. In RISC-V, we also have these 
privilege rings. In Risk V, there are three different uh, privilege levels. Side note, it's not obligated for a processor to offer all of them, but let's keep that aside for now. Let's assume we have a Risk V processor and it offers all of these privilege levels. You have machine mode, supervisor mode, and user mode. That's what they are named. And in machine mode, you have full control. You can uh, perform any machine instruction, any instruction in the Risk v instruction set architecture. You have full access. And this is typically used only during boot. So whenever you're booting your operating system and you have to uh, configure certain stuff about the processor, for example, enabling a floating point unit or other stuff, you're going to do this in machine mode. Um, then once the processor is booted and everything is configured correctly, you're typically going to switch to supervisor mode. This is the mode in which an operating system will be running. The code of an operating system, of the kernel, the, the core of the operating system, that will be running in supervisor mode. So most instructions will be allowed to execute in this supervisor mode. And then lastly, you have user mode. And whenever we are executing user programs, let's say programs we don't necessarily trust, um, or well, the operating system wants to be isolated from these user programs, then we are in user mode. So you have these three privilege levels, user mode for user programs, supervisor mode for the kernel, machine mode, basically for starting up your processor and configuring everything correctly. Now, how does our operating system play into this? So our operating system is going to use these mechanisms, mostly the supervisor and user mode separation to implement certain things such as process isolation. So first of all, on an operating system, whenever you start a program, you're going to have an instantiated process, which is executing your program for you. Um, and multiple, as I said before in this um, presentation, multiple processes need to be isolated from each other. You don't want process A reading memory from process B, modifying memory, modifying code. You want them to be separated. Um, your operating system is also going to provide other services next to isolation. For example, it's going to um, allow multiple processes to be active at the same time, uh, maybe on different CPU cores, or maybe um, it will say process A can run for X amount of time and then switch to process B on a core. And then, then we do, uh, we switch the processes. That's called scheduling. Or um, it will might, the operating system might allow different processes to communicate with each other. The operating system will also provide some drivers uh, for the different devices connected to your PC. Um, this is all going to be code executing with a high privilege level in supervisor mode. And uh, for example, file systems, you could imagine file systems being implemented in the supervisor mode inside of the kernel could also live in user space. Let's all go into deep into detail here. So, so far you have been using an operating system in this course. So you've of course, obviously been using the operating system on your own computer to program. So maybe windows or Ubuntu or another distribution of Linux, or maybe you're on um, Mac OS, I don't know, but also our RARS emulator, it's not only a RISC-V processor emulator, it emulates a bit more than that. It basically internally provides you with a small minimal operating system. So um, you have actually been programming for an operating system. The programs that you were writing in RARS so far have all been executed in user mode. That means you didn't have access to every single instruction in the RISC-V ISA. If you go look at the RISC-V specifications, you might find some instructions that you cannot execute from RARS because they have to be executed in machine mode or in supervisor mode. So as I said, RARS implements an operating system and operating systems can provide services for user programs. We've discussed this. How is this implemented in hardware? How does an architecture do this? Well, it works, it all works based on system calls. So a system call 
is basically a request for a service from the operating system. In risk five, this is called an environment call. So, um, to give an example, um, we have a bunch of system calls listed right here on the slides. So for example, print integer, this is a system call that the RARS operating system provides. So Linux will have a completely different set of system calls than RARS, than Windows. Any operating system can choose which system calls they implement and which they don't. It all depends on your hardware, um, what devices are connected. It, it depends on so many factors. So RARS just gives us a basic uh, amount of system calls so that we can practice writing code with system calls and see what they do and how it works. So for example, calls that are being provided to us are print integer, read integer. So print integer prints an integer to the RARS console. console, console. Um, how does it work? Well, you're going to load the integer that you want to print into A0. You're going to load the value one into A7. And then you're going to call the eCall instruction. We will get back to this with a code example, but it's as simple as that. And then RARS will execute the system call for you. So you've requested to print a certain integer. So RARS will print this integer to the console. Um, reading an integer works very similar. Only you don't have to provide an input argument. Instead, you just load the value five now in A7. And then in A0, you will get the result. The re so what readInt will do is it will ask the user to input an integer while your program is running. So it will pause the program execution. It will ask the user, please enter a number. Um, you enter this number, you press enter. And then this number you entered as the user will be in A0. Those are two very simple examples of system calls. We have a whole list of system calls. You can find it on the RARS GitHub page, environment calls. These are the calls that are supported. So there's a lot of them. Take a look through the list to see what you can do. Keep in mind, these are not all typical. Um, these are not all typical system calls. Some of them are, some of them are very specific to the simulator. So, um, for example, we also have this read from a file descriptor. So you could read from certain files, um, and many more, um, system calls. Now let's take a look at a simple, very simple example program. So in RARS, you have the console and on the left here, oh, we have a small program system call.asm, which you will find on Toledo as well. Um, and what it does is it simply prints the number 666 and then the program finishes. So um, how does this work? Well, as explained already in the previous slide, we load the value 666 in A0, we load the value one on A7. A7 is going to be the register that decides which system call you're going to execute. So from this list, print int would be the A7 value one. And then, for print int, you could see here in A0, you expect the integer to print. So when you want to execute a system call, take a look at the big table on the RARS GitHub, see what input registers are expected and what values they expect, load the code of the system call on A7, and then simply execute this new instruction called eCall or environment call. And this will execute your syscall. So um, let's go look at a little bit more complex program, some program that executes a few different system calls. In this case, uh, we have a string in the data section, str. Um, and then what we do is first we call read int, which is system call five. It doesn't have any input registers. So we just load the code of the system call into a seven and we call e call. This will now pass program execution until the user has entered a number in the console. So in this console here, you can see the user entered the number two and then pressed enter. And at that point, this e call ended and it moved this value two into A0. This value two is then backed up into T0 because in the next line, the address of the string is loaded into A0. 
Why? Well, the print string system call expects the address of a string in A0. So that's what happens in these two lines, address of the string in A0. Next, we load a value 4 into A7. Value 4 is the code of the print string system call. We call eCall and we execute the print string function. This will print you entered and then these two um, semi, not a semicolon, a colon, a regular colon. So this prints this string. Keep in mind this 2 is not printed yet. So now we move the 2 which we backed up into T0 right here. We move that now to A0 again. Then we load the value 1 into A7 which is going to select the print integer system call and we will call E call once more. This will print the value 2. If you want to print an enter, a new line, you have to use backslash n. So that's why there is no new line here. If you don't provide a backslash n in your string, there's not going to be a new line printed. Lastly, we do something, one more special thing. We execute the tenth system call. And system call number 10 basically calls exit 0. It exits your program with status code 0. So um, you can see this here, program is finished running 0. While in the previous slide, and what you've seen so far normally is program finished running dropped off bottom. This means you actually didn't end your program. There was just no more code to execute. Um, well, in reality, you should end programs with an exit system call. So from now on, when you're writing your program, try to end it using the exit system call. There is also an exit system call, so an ace, so the tenth system call always exits with code zero. There's a different system call you can use to exit with a separate status code. So you could have different exits in your program with a certain status code, depending on where the end of your program was reached. So you could have an exit in case of an error condition and you could exit maybe with the value 10, meaning some kind of exit. So it should be clear to you now how we can call system calls using RISC-V assembly. So as a user, it should be obvious how to use these system calls. And this is also the simple part. Using system calls is very simple. The operating system takes control whenever we call eCall and it will handle all of this for us. Easy. But so now let's take a look also at how this actually works. But before we're going to explain how system calls work, let's first take a small sidestep to um, our previous session about dynamic memory. So um, in this presentation, I've already shown you quickly this SBRK system call. And I'm going to get back to this, but this is closely related to dynamic memory. So let's take a look first at the process layout um, in the RARS operating system. So um, the way whenever you start a program, you have this big address space of addresses you can use and your program will have a certain fixed layout. This is determined by your operating system. Your operating system is going to decide what to put where basically in memory. So in RARS, you can configure this, but I've shown the default layout here. And what's happening here? Well, right at the bottom, you have this text section. Um, in this text section, your code is being saved. So if you um, try to load this address, you're going to load some code that's stored there. Most of your jumps, or probably all of your jumps, are going to be landing right here in this text segment. The external segment, we're not going to discuss, look up if you're interested in what the segment does, but this is mapped above the text segment, below the data segment. The data segment is where we are storing all of our variables by default. Then, these are the global variables, the one that we know in advance, the one that we put, of course, in the data section. So last session, remember, in the data section, we created this big heap. But in reality, when we're working with operating systems, this is not what happens because if we do that, then we have a 
a big, big data section by default, while our data section could be a lot smaller. And remember again, we are allocating a million bytes, for example, but maybe we will never use these bytes. And in a not operating system, you actually really care about that. You don't want processes to reserve more memory than they actually need. No, what you want to do as an operating system is reserve just enough memory for processes that they can be loaded and start running. And whenever they need more memory, well, then they can just ask for more. And for exactly that, we are going to use the SBRK system call. Basically, SBRK is going to ask the operating system. It's a system call. Please, operating system, I need more memory. Can you give this to me? That's what SBRK does in words. So what it does in practice is you have in the OS, it's going to put some extra regions. So you already know the stack region. This is also a region of memory that's being, that's gross. It starts at this address and it grows from a high address to a low address. So what's drawn here is a stack with a bunch of elements on there. So the stack pointer is now at a lower address than the start of the stack. And similarly, we have a region which is called the heap. So uh, we discussed heaps last time. Heaps um, are going to be used to create these dynamic structures. Um, so that's all previous session. But now no, the operating system actually provides support for us to create this heap which can grow in size over time. So this heap region initially, it's pretty much just empty. There is nothing there. And every time you call the SBRK system call, you're going to increase the size of the heap. How much? Well, SBRK, it asks you for the amount of bytes that you need in A0. And then the operating system is going to expand the region of the heap with A0 bytes. It's going to make this bigger. Initially, there is nothing here and this expands upwards. By the way, this is also the reason, one of the reasons the stack grows downwards because we have two regions which are dynamic in size. The text region, you know in advance how big it is. You compile your code, you know how big it is. The data section, you know how big it is. The external session, you know how big it is. The memory mapped IO section, which we're not going to discuss, but you know how big it is. But the stack and the heap, they grow during the lifetime of your process. And you don't want to reserve too much space in advance. And so what they have decided to do is to let these grow towards each other at both ends of the address space. That's why they decided to let the stack grow downwards. And then all of the space in between does not need to be allocated. So there might be addresses here, but they are not necessarily present in memory. Again, I'm not going to go too deep into that concept of allocating memory and, and having half allocated processes. This is a part of typically virtual memory, and this is something for an operating systems course, uh, which a lot of you will probably have next year. But now know now that uh, we have two different regions and they grow towards each other. The heap now, it grows towards in the positive direction. So towards the high addresses, while the stack, that's why we always are decrementing the stack pointer, it grows from high to low. And now we know that we have the SBRK system call, SBRKN, which expands this heap region with n bytes. Now, let's take a look again at our simple allocator. So in the simple allocator, as I already mentioned, we reserve these million bytes of data section. So do not make this static section unnecessarily large. We use SBRK to allocate n bytes to get our dynamic uh, growing region. So in the previous session, we learned to make a heap like this, but from now on, it's better for you to use SBRK um, to allocate bytes to expand the heap region. Now, there's a second thing I need to discuss and let me move myself in a corner somewhere. So, um, what we did last time, we reserved this heap region, but, um, well, we used the GP, the global pointer, as a way of storing an index into this heap. We incremented that each time we reserved memory in the heap. 
And we did that for a specific reason, and that is, well, we needed a register that is neither Kali safe nor caller safe, because otherwise it was very difficult to implement this. Now in reality, this was a bit of a cop out. This was not really, this is not how you should do this in practice. The global pointer has a very, very different purpose. So the global pointer, what it does is it points on a typical OS or on RISC-V, you're going to point this to the middle of a four kilobyte memory region. For example, your data section. You're going to point this in the middle. Why? Why in the middle? So you can use this global pointer in memory references. So this code here loads into A0. It loads the value, well, 0x799 plus GP. You know this type of code. And this is a single instruction. Imagine you would want to load variable A located here, right at the top of this four kilobyte region or variable B right at the bottom. If you would have to load this in a normal way, what you would write is LWA0 and then the label var A. And if you would assemble this uh, and you would look at the actual code being executed, you would see that this is actually taking two instructions, one to translate the label address and then one to actually load the value at that address. And this is two instructions, so it's less efficient than doing it, doing it in one instruction. So all of the variables located within two kilobytes higher or two kilobytes lower of the global pointer can be accessed in only one instruction using the GP pointer. This is the purpose of the GP pointer. Now, why four kilobytes? Well, the offset you can provide from a register, the maximum is 0x799 and the minimum is negative 0x800. These are minimum maximum. If you try to make it one larger, oh, this, is, this, this is not possible. Why? You would see this if you would transform this into bits. You need just enough bits to store this number and you cannot store any higher numbers than this with the amount of bits you have in your instruction. So your instruction itself, this value, if, you, if you're translating this instruction, this value itself is going to be encoded in the bits of the instruction. And you don't have infinite amount of bits, so you don't have an infinite range. This is the range you have. So this is purely GP, is basically an optim is used to optimize code size for certain variables, probably variables you want to access often. So now that we have a different method of allocating dynamic memory, SBRK is our different methods of allocating memory. We have, we have that now. Now that we have that, we don't need to use GP anymore and we don't need to reserve memory in the data section anymore. Because in practice, that's not what happens. And SBRK is much easier um, or a much better way of doing this. Okay. Now let's talk about one more thing from previous session. And that's the malloc function. So if you're going to call SBRK for every time you're going to allocate space, that's going to be inefficient. Remember, so, well, we haven't talked actually yet about this. We're going to go into this now after these slides. First of all, a system call has quite some overhead. Implementing a system call, it's, it's going to be a lot of instructions that are going to be executed within the system call. So it, it has a lot of overhead. Um, it requires the kernel to handle this, but also um, there is no good way with SBRK of freeing. Yes, you can provide a negative number to SBRK to decrease the size of the heap. But what if you first allocate A, then allocate B, and then you want to free A? You can't do that without also freeing B. This is the same problem we had last time. We wanted an allocator function that also allows us to free. So. What does C do? What do programming languages do? They provide complex allocators for their users. In the last exercise of previous session, which I really recommend trying, it's a difficult one, but try it. You can learn a lot from this. In that exercise, we were asked to now 
change the simple allocator so that it's possible to also free previously allocated memory. And SBRK doesn't do this. SBRK is basically our simple allocator for the heap region. While malloc is a library function, so if you call malloc in C, which reserves bytes, but also allows you to free and or deallocate specific bytes. And it does this with complex structures, which keeping a list of free blocks as hinted in the last exercise session in the last exercise. So um, you don't need to uh, use malloc or free on the exam. So we don't provide you with a malloc implementation necessarily. Uh, it's, it's very complex. We're not going to ask you to write a malloc function, but just know that in C, when we call malloc, in fact, we, we are calling a complex memory allocator, which allows us to free previously allocated memory. While if we call SBRK, all we're doing is expanding the heap region. Much more simple. Both allocate bytes, but they do it in a different way. So now you should be realizing the difference between, first of all, what we did in the previous session, where we created a big data section with a big chunk of memory and the global pointer pointing within there, which was just a way of explaining dynamic memory, but not the way it happens in practice. GPS has a different purpose. You should now know that SBRK functions as a simple allocator and is a good replacement for what we did last session. And then you should know that malloc is a C function, which is basically the implementation of a complex allocator. It could be very uh, informative for you to look at the implementation of malloc and see if you understand what's happening there. It's not necessarily easy. Let me move me myself back into frame. Let's now um, jump back to risk five, place myself in the middle of this slide so that you can read everything. So uh, what we're going to talk about now are interrupts and exceptions. So previously I told you we're going to get back to how system calls work. Well, we're now getting there. And this is closely related to interrupts and to exceptions. These are all concepts. Um, interrupts, for example, what is that? Well, let's say you press a key on your keyboard. Um, what's going to happen is, well, your operating system needs to be aware that the fact of the fact that this key has been pressed so that it can send this key press. Remember your operating system might implement your keyboard driver and this driver, it needs to send this key press to the application that was probably currently open on the screen. It's a job of the operating system. But the operating system was probably already doing something. It was not simply listening for key presses. It was doing other stuff. So you're basically interrupting your operating system. Literally, you're, you're disturbing him. You're pressing keys while it's doing other stuff. So what happens internally then is there's going to be a certain flag raised to the fact that there is an interrupt being occurred. And your operating system can see, oh, there's an interrupt. Someone wants to interrupt me. And when it's, whenever it has a, a good moment to check this, it will take a look at this interrupt and uh, it will handle this. And how will this interrupt be handled? This will be do done by raising a trap. I get back to that. But so the operating system sees, oh, a key has been pressed. Let's raise a trap to handle this key press. Exception is a different thing. So it's possible that stuff can go wrong. You could write a faulty program um, that, does, that does certain stuff. Um, for example, uh, you could jump to an illegal instruction. If your program coiner is pointing to an instruction and that instruction does not exist, then you get an illegal instruction. What can your processor do at that point? How can he solve this? He, of course he can't solve this. So what, it, what he does is he raises an exception. And when an exception is raised, we immediately trap. So for an interrupt, we don't necessarily immediately raise a trap. We can handle this whenever we are ready to handle this. An exception, you need to handle this immediately. You need to trap. This is typically used when something goes wrong, but not only. It's actually exceptions are used for more than just when things go wrong. 
What else are exceptions for being used, for example, to implement system calls? So the eCall environment call instruction in RISC-V is simply just another exception. So you have this exception here, um, number eight and number nine, and especially this number eight is the one you want to focus on. You're in user mode, your processor is in user mode, and you execute eCall. What's going to happen? You're going to jump. Well, you're going to raise a trap. You're going to cause an exception. eCall is going to cause an exception. It's going to raise a trap. And then let's see what happens. So we have here different reasons a trap can be raised. An interrupt can raise a trap. An exception can raise a trap. And an eCall is just a special exception. And that also raises a trap. Now let's see what happens. What does that mean, raise a trap? This becomes somewhat complicated. So what happens on a high level, when a trap happens, your processor jumps to a specific place in memory, which is called the trap handler. This trap handler will have code to deal with a trap. Now, where is this code located and what address is the, operating, uh, is the processor going to jump to? Well, this is being stored in registers. So in your processor, you have your normal registers, the one that you use, your T0s, your A0s, and so forth. You also have control and status registers. And these are being used for special uh, stuff, let's say. For example, you have the UTVEC um, register. The UTVEC register stores an address. What address? Well, the address of the trap handler of the user mode. You also have a trap handler in supervisor mode and a trap handler in machine mode. You have three different trap handlers. The addresses are stored in control status registers. You also have some different CSR registers, which contain information about the trap. So uh, what was the trap that occurred? Uh, at what location in memory did this trap occur? The other registers are going to contain information about the trap so that the operating system knows how to deal with the trap. Or the operating system, when we get into machine mode, it also could be that the user mode handles this trap. In that case, your operating system is not the one responsible. No, the program itself tries to solve the, pro the problem. So um, you now probably wonder, well, which mode is it? Who is going to handle the trap? And that all depends. So by default, when an exception happens, when an interrupt occurs, we raise a trap. The trap makes the processor by default go to machine mode. But there are certain registers, the deleg, delegation registers, let's call them, which delegates exceptions to a lower privilege level. So let's say in user mode, you execute an eCall. eCall is automatically going to be handled in supervisor mode. Let's say you do an illegal instruction. You could, well, you could set M, ME deleg, machine mode exception delegation. You could set a certain bit in ME deleg to forward all illegal instruction exceptions to the supervisor mode trap handler. And the supervisor mode trap handler could forward, again, all of these exceptions, let's say the uh, illegal instruction in the exception, it could forward this to user mode. So using these ME deleg and SE deleg registers, you can delegate certain exceptions to certain modes. Um, and that's how is being decided what specific, um, what specific mode and what specific handler is going to handle. So if it's machine mode that handles it, the handler is an empty vec. The address of the handler is an empty vec. If it's supervisor mode, an empty vec, and so forth. So that's what happens when a trap occurs. Your code jumps to one of three locations: the machine mode handler, the supervisor mode handler, or the user mode trap handler depending on how your delegation registers are configured. That's how it works in RISC-V. Now let's take a look at these different control status registers that are being used in these trap handlers. 
to determine what actually happened and what needs to be done by the operating system. Because right now we're in the strap handler and we know, well, a trap has occurred. But what trap? Was it a system call? Was there an interrupt? Was there an exception? What exception was there? And so forth. And now we're going to use these control and status registers. So every um, uh, privilege level has their own set of registers, all used in their own respective handlers. And so let's take a look at the user versions in user mode. You have the user status register, the use status. And this is basically a special register. You, you cannot write to this register from user mode. This provides a view to the supervisor and the M status registers. What this contains is the information about the configuration of your CPU, the way traps are handled to fact. If, so for example, this interrupt enable register for user mode, this is actually a part of the use status register. So you can read the value of interrupt enable. And if this is one, interrupts are enabled. If this is zero, interrupts are not enabled. Now, you also have this UTVEC. So these two are not super important for us today. Um, UTVEC is of course very important because that's where we stored the address of the trap handler of our code that will need to deal with our traps. So UTVEC has the trap handler code. Um, then use scratch is just a temporary register. You can use this in a trap handler to uh, write any values and you can be sure you uh, are not overwriting. For example, if you want to use T0 as a temporary register, you need to save this, restore this. Um, but as a trap handler, you don't want to mess with too many registers, probably with no registers. So you can use the use scratch as a, as a register for that. Um, no one else is going to use this. Then UEPC, this, this will um, contain the address of the instruction where stuff went wrong. So um, whenever you have your exception, UEPC, or whenever you have your trap, UEPC will be set to the location where in, in the code where this trap occurred. This allows us, when we're done handling a trap, to jump back to UEPC or maybe to the instruction after UEPC, so UEPC plus four in a 32-bit mode. So um, UEPC has the address of where the problem occurred. So uh, UCOS will have the cause of the problem. This will have a status code in here in UCOS. And the status code corresponds to these exception codes in the table. So if you have status code two, an illegal instruction occurred. Now, um, it's possible that you, uh, for example, did a, for example, a load access fault. And then the address of this load access will be in UTVAL. So let's say we have a load, um, load access fault uh, or a load address misaligned. And we would have UCOS4 and UTVAL the wrong address value. Lastly, we have the UIP, the user interrupt pending. Remember, could it be an exception? System calls a special form of exception. Or it could be an interrupt, right? You can see it here as well. Or it could be an interrupt that causes your trap handler to be executed. So UIP says if it was an interrupt or not. Those are the control status registers you can use from user mode to determine in the user trap handler what happened, what caused this trap. Let's quickly summarize. So we have interrupts, we have exceptions, both raise traps. When a trap occurs, we jump to a trap handler in a certain mode, um, depending on the VEC register, and the mode depends on the delegation registers. Then this handler needs to solve the problem, the trap that occurred. It uses information from the control status registers to actually solve this trap. When it's done, it can jump back to the code using the UEPC register, which is one of the control registers. And um, an e-call is just a special form of an exception. This is how system calls are implemented. You execute e-call. Internally, your processor throws an exception, which is you throw a trap, you jump to the trap handler. The trap handler sees, oh, so this is going to be the supervisor trap handler sees, oh, you threw an exception. The status code was eight. So you threw an e-call. So you want to do a system call. So let's execute the system call that you requested and then jump back. So e-call is not really an error, but it's still 
causes an exception. And that's the way you basically hand control from a user program to the kernel and back using this e-call causing an exception. Now about RARS or operating system here or emulator but also the tiny operating system RARS the simulator does not allow us um, to write supervisor exception handlers so whenever we execute an e-call we jump to the supervisor exception handler but you cannot do this in RARS this is all simulated on the background what RARS does allow you to do to get an intuition of how exception handling works is write exception handlers for user mode. So in RARS we are always programming in user mode and we can write exception handlers for user mode. Um, and now we're going to take a look at how we can actually write our own custom exception handler. Let's take a look at some RISC-V code again. So um, you're going to see some new stuff here. Let's go over it first slowly. First of all, we have three different functions here. Two are important, handler and main. We know our main function, of course. This handler is going to be our exception handler. So we simply made a label and then we wrote the code of our exception handler. Now, let's not look at the exception handler just yet. Just know it's located here as a label handler. All right, now remember, when an exception occurs, we jump to utvec. So if we want to jump to our own custom exception handler, we need to set utvec to um, the address of our exception handler. It's as simple as that. So our main function, what it does in the beginning, is it loads the address of our handler in t0, and then it executes this weird instruction csrrw. Now, what does that do? CSRRW moves a value between control registers and regular registers. You cannot simply use a regular move for this. You need to use specialized instructions to do this. Um, CSRRW, it moves the value from CSR, your middle argument, to the first register. Let me move myself. Um, and it moves the value from register one uh, from register 2, sorry, into CSR. So let's say, take a look at the second line of code here. CSR RW 0 UTVEC T0. What does this do? This moves the value from UTVEC to the 0 register. When you move something to the 0 register, you basically say, we don't care. We discard this. So zero, if you write to the zero register, nothing happens. The zero register is hardwired to zero. So basically we say, we don't care about the old value of UTVEC, just discard it or write it to the zero register so that we'll get rid of it. Um, but what we do care about is the fact that we write the value T0 to UTVEC because in T0 is the address of our handler. So now we have configured our processor to jump to the address in T0, which is the address of the handler, when an exception occurs. Now, in RARS, we need to do one more thing. This is not necessarily something you do in every RISC-V implementation. This is specific to RARS, but we have to do this. We have to set the interrupts enable. So you can disable or enable interrupts, and RARS refuses to do exception handling if interrupts are disabled. So to enable interrupts, what we're going to do is we're going to write the value one here to the use status register. Um, and then we set interrupts, we enable interrupts. So just don't think too much about this line, just put it whenever you wanna enable um, interrupts. If, if you don't have this in a solution on your exam, I won't mind, um, but you need to do it for RARS if you want stuff to work. Okay, so the most important thing here is this UTVEC here. You move the address of your handler into UTVEC and then we're going to execute LWT01. Now, the load word instruction requires you to provide an address here, which is a multiple of four. If you don't provide an address that is a multiple of four, 
This is called a misaligned load. So this is, has to do with performance optimization reasons. You, you don't want to load words over word boundaries. So um, it's not allowed. So an exception is raised by executing LWT01. Your processor cannot deal with this. Um, it cannot execute this instruction. So it raises an exception. Which exception? Well, load address misaligned. That's what the exception is that's being raised. Exception code four. So let's go back to our code. So this instruction, LWT01, will cause our processor to jump to our exception handler. Our exception handler, what is going to happen here, is going to store the value of UCOS in A0 and then write the value zero to UCOS. So we, uh, we basically read the value from u cause in A0. What value is going to be in an A0? The value four. That was the exception code of the misaligned load. Now what we do here in our code is we load the address of T0. We load the address of end for here, the end. Um, so uh, this end label, we load this address into T0 and then we write this address in T0, we write this to UEPC. Why do we do this? Well, if you want to return from an exception handler, this is not the same as returning from a function call. We cannot just do red. For returning from an exception handler, we're going to use uret. So, or sret or mret, depending on the mode you're in. But we are going to write user mode exception, so we are going to write uret. And, um, what is uret going to do? It's going to jump to uepc. So we don't want uepc before this line of code was pointing to this instruction, the faulting instruction. So if we don't do this line of code, you can verify this. If you remove this line of code, we create an infinite loop because uret jumps to the faulting instruction. It tries again and you just go in the loop back to your handler and so forth. So you don't want that. You don't want to create an infinite loop. You want to jump. So a misaligned load, our exception handler here has no way of solving this misaligned load. It doesn't know a good solution. So since there's no good solution, let's just end our program. So let's load the address of end into the program counter, the UEPC, and then execute URAT, which jumps to UEPC. And what this does is it exits with status code 42. Remember I said you can do an exit with a status code. Um, so with the system called 93, you can exit, um, not with 42, you can exit with a value in A0. So this is a small typo, it has to be four. So um, you exit with a value in A0 and the value in A0 was four because we wrote the U cause to A0. So this program, it executes and it exits with status code four, which was the exception code. Now, let's say you didn't do this UTVEC stuff, then RARS would simply have shown you the exception in the console. Uh, because now we wrote our custom handler. If you don't provide a custom handler, RARS is just going to stop the execution whenever it encounters an exception and it's going to print your uh, answer to the console. So that's how we can write our own custom user mode trap handler in RARS. Um, write the UTVEC, the address of your handler, use the cause registers, use the other registers to actually handle the exception. That was it for this session on operating systems and RISC-V operating system support. In the extra sessions, we're going to now learn how to actually use system calls to call them quite simple and also ask you to write some custom exception handler codes.